Happy holidays. I'm Niel, Los Angeles Sentinel reporter. We are your number one news source for black news, views, and advocacy. I'm really excited right now as an African-American woman to be sitting amongst giants and advocates for African-Americans and just for our nation at large. I'm sitting here today with the authors of For Color Girls Who Have Considered Politics. We have the legendary and still kicking up dust, Ms. Donna Brazil. <laughs> we have also uh, Leah Daltrey and Yolanda Carr. Oh, wait. Welcome back to the Sentinel. Thank you. Thank you. It's great uh, to be back. Um, we are so happy that you are here. African American women and books are the topic in this nation right now. We have Michelle Obama and we have you ladies. For color girls, it, it has the topic of politics, but it's also really about friendship, right? Yeah. Whose idea was it for you guys to come together and tell this story? It was originally we originally had an offer by a, um, a cable network hmm. to they wanted to buy her story. We have a good friend who was a uh, producer in, uh, out here in LA, and she's a very good producer. And she came to DC to come to dinner with us for a couple of times and. She said, you know, people ought to know about your story. You're really kind of, kind of hidden figures. And she wanted to put together a treatment, uh, which she did. And she sold the idea to Oprah, who had a deal with the studio. And next thing we knew, we had me out here in LA. Um, she did her pitch. And as you'll see, as we're talking, we kind of talk over each other, talk to each other. We were doing that then. And they said, wow. After about 20 minutes into the pitch, they said, we're buying this. We want this. You have enough stories for five years, and you know, I said we got enough stories for thirty years. <laughs> wow! As it turned out, the story was more like scandal than it was like us. Mm. And we had a male friend, a good male friend of ours, take a look at it, and he said, "You know, you ladies have done too much to come out of the box like this. This is just I don't think you want people to see it this way because it was just so not like." Us, it was totally fiction, and I, and I was supposed to be fiction, but still, it wasn't really didn't have much to do with us. Okay. Um, so we decided not to do it, and and we decided we would write a book instead and tell the story. So we tell it the way we want to tell it. What do you want individuals to walk away with after they read this book? A few things. One, we want them to understand our role in America, in the American political system. The folks that mentored us, that, uh, the folk, what we've been able to accomplish, and the impact that some of our mentors, like Reverend Jesse Jackson, uh, Dr. Coretta Scott King, have had on the American political system, and, and what they instilled in us that allowed us to do the work that we've done to bring about changes. We hope it will inspire the next generation of political leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you choose to run for office or whether you choose to work in the background, whether you choose to work in your community organization, we hope we will inspire and encourage uh, women to step forward, claim their seat at the table. If there's not a seat, find a seat, as Shirley Chisholm said, bring in a folding chair mm -hmm. to uh, make your voice heard. We hope that we will uh, encourage women to understand that they have a voice. Mm -hmm. And it's important now more than ever, and black women have been activists for centuries. Mm -hmm. But now more than ever, I think we're seeing black women step from the shadows mm -hmm. and step into the forefront. So we're hoping we'll give women a gentle push mm -hmm. uh, to step on out there and, and claim your seat, be who you can be, and lead our communities forward. We need you. Uh -huh. Now you talk um, a little bit about um, some of the people that you look up to. Um, one of the chapters in the book references uh, Dorothy Heights, yes. um, the National Council of Negro Women. Um, in your journey, how important um, was that institution and just, you know, Dorothy Heights, a lot of people say the big six. Mm -hmm. And sometimes she gets credit for being one of the six and sometimes she doesn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, when you see those powerful photos of her sitting in the White House, mm -hmm. you know, and being an advocate, like how much did that, that inspire you in your career and getting to the place that you are today? Well, Dr. Height was truly a, a giant in American politics and American life and American culture. Um, she worked with Mary McLeod Bethune uh, when um, Eleanor Roosevelt reached out to to have her at the table along with Dr. Uh, Mary McLeod Bethune. Uh, Dorothy Height was a trailblazer in many other ways um, through throughout her long career as a public servant and also as a leader uh, for women and uh, black women in particular. 
uh, Dr. Height, I believe, helped to set a, the, the table for future generations by uh, giving women the opportunity to, to grow and to prosper. Uh, I got to know Dr. Height, Leah uh, knew her well, uh, mm -hmm. along with Mignon and, and Yolanda. I got to work with her on several initiatives, including uh, organizing uh, the Black Family Reunion on the Mall. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Height was uh, uh, one of the leaders in, in, in trying to bring uh, black, uh, you know, the black community together to empower others and to uh, make sure that our voices would not be, would be heard throughout our country. She was, in many ways, uh, a, a very special leader in my life, uh, always uh, uh, encouraging me to go to the next level, whatever it might be. Uh, but, but opening up her office uh, and her organization so that we had a, a place to call home mm -hmm. uh, when we were not doing political campaigns. So mm -hmm. I, I have tremendous respect and I, I, I miss her. I miss her leadership. Mm -hmm. I, miss, I miss her voice. She was someone, whenever she spoke up, she was eloquent. She knew exactly where she wanted to, to go in terms of the, the country itself. But more importantly, she wanted to see more women at the table. Mm. That's what I like most about that time. So she's smiling right now, right? Oh, <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? I, I, I was thinking today about Dr. Hype because I met Nancy Wilson at an mm -hmm. NCNW event years ago. Uh, and also met Nancy Wilson through Reverend Jesse Jackson. We talk a lot about Reverend Jackson in our book. But those leaders, um, whether it's Dorothy Hype, Shirley Chisholm, who we had already mentioned, Coretta Scott King, Betty Shabazz, uh, Reverend Willie Barrow from the Push Rainbow, uh, we had an opportunity to work with them and to learn from them, and that made a huge difference in our lives. Okay, well you talked a lot about people that you worked with in the book, Jess Jackson, Walter Mondale, uh, Michael Dukakis, Bill Clinton, mm -hmm. Al Gore, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton. Um, Mentioning all those names, what are some of your favorite moments with these individuals or highlights in your career? when you hear those names? I think about Shirley uh, Chisholm a lot because um, she inspired me. I was, you know, Miss Chisholm was elected 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, she hails from Brooklyn, where mm -hmm. Leah hails from. And if you think about this next, uh, I was just looking just now, 24 women will serve in the United States Senate, 102 will serve in the United States House of Representatives. Right here but Ms. Chisholm was the first, the mm -hmm. first black woman. Uh, and when that door opened for her, she kept it open for other women of color. I think had she lived, she would be so proud to see Ayanna Presley, mm -hmm. Jolanda Hayes, and all of the remarkable Lucy Macbeth, the women who will be sitting in the Congress uh, come January 3rd. So. Uh, I think Ms. Chisholm would, would really be happy also at this moment in our history. Coretta Scott King, uh, I had an opportunity to work with her on the 20th anniversary of the historic 63 March on Washington, as well as the campaign to make Martin Luther King's birthday a national holiday. Mm -hmm. Mrs. King was, in her own way, a leader, a leader of the movement, and a leader who understood that the movement had to expand the coalition in order to thrive and survive. And so, and I think about Dr. Betty Shabazz and, and so many other women, Maya Angelou, mm -hmm. we, we, we're not just name dropping. They, they played a, a, a very critical role in our development and, and also a, a very uh, vital role in our success as organizers, as strategists, as entrepreneurs. So uh, we lift them up everywhere we go because they truly are heroines and heroes. Okay, mm -hmm. what about you ladies? Ron Brown was a very good friend of mine. It's a chapter in the book. Yep, mm -hmm. a chapter on Ron. Um, he always wanted to be DNC chair, which a lot of people never knew about. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, towards the end of um, the Jackson campaign in 88, Reverend Jackson had actually asked him to run the campaign, okay. but he couldn't leave his law firm to do that at the time. So uh, towards the end of the campaign, he had this, uh, Reverend Jackson called this meeting and called in like, you know, there's donors and people from across the country, and he sat down and he talked about you know, how we've gotten so far, and you know I've gotten this far by faith, and now I need my A team on the, the uh, field with me. Mm -hmm. And he said that he put his hands on Ron's shoulders, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, the next day I get a call from Ron saying that 
you know, I really want to do something to help, and maybe there's something I can do in the interim or on the convention or something. And I said, well, how about being a convention manager? And I said, it's not unusual for a candidate to pick a different convention manager than the campaign manager, because there are two things going on simultaneously. Um, so he said, well, you know, Matt, that's a possibility. And I said, you know, if you really still want to be chair of the DNC, that's a very good way for you to get back into things. And, you know, you can be the peacemaker, the negotiator. So that was kind of the plan. And um, he did, and he did all the negotiations um, for the, the campaign and between the two campaigns. Um, we were able to get, I think we got 25, 20, 25 DNC members added to the roles of the DNC. Mm -hmm. We got rules changes. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of things. We didn't actually, we didn't win the nomination, but we won a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. And the biggest outcome out of that whole movement was uh, Ron becoming chair of the DNC. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. so I think for, for our friendship, it was, um, I was in 2008, I was the chief of staff at the DNC, so I could not endorse anybody, mm -hmm. which was a very happy place for me to be. I didn't have to choose mm -hmm. between Hillary or Obama. Uh, and then I, of course, became the CEO of the convention, 2008 convention, so it was good I hadn't endorsed because I had to work with uh, both sides, and the same thing in 16, I was uh, the CEO of the convention, so I, I couldn't endorse. Um, but for our friendship, I think in 08, it was, um, we knew it was going to be difficult, um, because you had, you know, Obama, the first black man, and you had Hillary, the first woman. Um, viable woman. Viable woman. Yeah, yeah. The first viable woman. Um, uh, who were really head to head. Mm -hmm. And what were we going to do? So, you know, part of the conversation we had when we had them at dinner, because uh, we hosted these dinners for the presidential uh, hopefuls, is, you know, post-dinners, you know, we, we don't all need to be in the same camp. It would be okay if people chose mm -hmm. different candidates to be, to be in so we would have influence mm -hmm. in, in, in all camps. And so of the set of us, you know, folks did different things, and it was okay. It didn't, it, I think toward the end of the Obama-Clinton campaign, it got a little itchy, a little mm -hmm. testy, uh, as, as, as the rubber meets the rolls, and Donna references the May 31st, 2008 Rules Committee, which, you know, I was not a rules member, I was watching mm -hmm. uh, from the front row as the chief of staff, and I could see all of the as I call them, shenanigans mm -hmm. that were happening, and, and and I think that was a, that was a tough, tough moment uh, as Donna uh, and um, Tia Flanoy, who's the fifth color girl, were both on the committee and what happened that day, from my perspective. That you can write is a shot heard around the world, in my opinion. Um, and sixteen was was the same. It was, but it, I think it was clearer. Donna was the chair, she couldn't endorse, I couldn't endorse, but everybody else went with Hillary mm -hmm. uh, because that's who they thought was the most viable candidate. But in the end, you know, we're not always on the same side of issues. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. like, you, like, any, like any set of friends, you yeah. pick different paths about, you know, who, who, who has good movies out or good music. You don't always agree, right. mm -hmm. but at the base for us, we have a... Uh, the same value system about what things are important. We may differ on strategy and tactics, but the, the baseline of what is important and our love for community and our commitment to service is mm -hmm. the same. And so we're always able to come back around. Um, we have all of these women's groups. We have the United States of Women. You have Higher Heights. Mm -hmm. You have Black Votes Matter. Um, you have so many women's organizations. You have the National Council of Negro Women with all of these different missions and, and goals. Do you think that that helps the movement or, 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 or does it hinder it? Because there's so many messages and, and people are trying to get this group of people and that group of people. I don't see them as yeah, competitive. I, don't either. I think Not each either. one appeals to a different yeah. set of women, a mm -hmm. different type of woman, but they're all striving for women's empowerment, black women's empowerment, it's simply not state of women, they, they, they are broader than black women. Mm -hmm. um, then, we brought in, then we bring in most of the women's groups to Power Rising. Yeah, right? and we, okay. we started our own conference, Power Rising, which is sort of a mix of all of those women, and mm -hmm. none of those women, because there are lots of women out there who aren't a member of any of those things. Mm -hmm. So Power Rising was is a, is a gathering by, for, and about black women, where we talk about all the phases of black women's lives and all the ways that we are working and striving and achieving. 
Uh, and we, we had our first conference in 2018, and we had 1,000 women from 35 states that showed up. So the next one is this coming February 20, February 21st to 24th in New Orleans. Oh, yeah, 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 you should come. I, I mean, PowerRising.org. Yeah, right. PowerRising.org. Okay. We learn together, we grow together, we yeah. dance together, we laugh, we laugh together, we, laugh, we, laugh, we, laugh, we cry, cry together. together. It's, it's, it's amazing. And we can get real poor boys together. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> and each one is, I feel about the women's groups like I feel about church denominations. Mm -hmm. It all yeah, good. Right. Find the one that works for you. Mm -hmm. Some people need a lot of rules. So mm -hmm. you go to the church with all the rules. Some people don't need no rules. Go to the church. But the point is you finding your way to the divine right so the same thing i feel like women's groups we're all about empowerment strengthening women positioning women getting women to the table find an organization that works for you and where you can put your shoulder to the wheel and, and help make progress okay so we're going to start wrapping up in a few minutes we're here with the authors for for color girls who have considered politics you definitely want to get this barnes and nobles amazon wherever you can get it get yes, the knowledge yes get the knowledge um so let's just come to current times we have this much wisdom we can't let you go um before we get to the meat and potatoes so we have an administration right now that is detrimental to this nation um we have a lot of people out in the field that they're talking about that's running for office um one of the things i wanted to know what are you guys thoughts about uh no more super delegates within the democratic party is that a good thing or bad thing well we super delegates or automatic delegates are still part of the democratic national committee uh -huh. i am a super delegate lee is a super delegate we will not have as of today, we will not have a vote on the first ballot when we get to the convention. Mm -hmm. uh, if the ballot, if there's a tie mm -hmm. or there's no uh, nominee and, the, and it goes to a second ballot, we will get a chance to vote. I do believe that we, uh, we are part of the process, whether we're elected official, party activists, party leaders, party fundraisers, we should have a seat at the table and we should have a vote at the table. I, I was disappointed that the party decided otherwise. It was a, uh, it was a, in my judgment, it was a bad, it was a bad move. Mm -hmm. But we we deserve to have a seat at the table. Why should Maxine Waters, who has she, she has worked extremely hard uh, to get within the leadership, why should she not have a vote on the first ballot? Why should John Lewis not have a vote on the first ballot? And Lucy Macbeth. So we will continue to fight for our right to, to participate and to have a vote on the first ballot. Mm -hmm. And when you said that, I thought about uh, last week when the Democratic uh, uh, House Democrats wanted to vote to have term limits on chair seats. Mm -hmm. As soon as you have so many African Americans, right. that's exactly. that too. And that is always, and that is always a challenge. Yeah. When always. we begin to make progress into the leadership, it, uh, to have more seats at the table, then suddenly the rules have to change. Mm -hmm. So you saw it last week with exactly what you're saying. Now that you have 28 subcommittees led by African American, what six sub so six committees, and that's just the African Americans. That's not counting the Latinos, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Now you want to change the rules, and now you want to enforce term limits. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with the super delegates. You know, black people and brown people went from being 10 percent of the super delegates. This cycle around with all the new people being elected, we will probably be about 40% of the super delegates. Mm -hmm. So th these are people who influence mm -hmm. and have something to say about who the nominee is. Now our voice has been silenced on the first round, just when we are getting into the state, where we have a real real voice yeah. and a real seat at the table. Now folks want to change the rule. And as Donna said, she and I were both opposed. We both went to the floor of the DNC meetings and made speeches about why this was the wrong move for the party. Mm -hmm. We were uh, we were not able to convince the majority. But I ultimately think that in the end, they will uh, realize that it was a mistake, mm -hmm. uh, that you're going, that you have silenced people, including all of these, the new members of Congress who are coming, 40, uh, uh, a majority of whom are under the age of 40. Mm -hmm. Now you're saying that the young people, the young members of Congress, Ayanna Presley, Johanna Hayes, Lauren Underwood, no voice in who the party's nominee is going to be. I don't think that was our intent. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's what the party really wanted or needed. As we talk, come to this moment in time where black and brown people are shifting mm -hmm. the balance of who's in power and who's voting. <clears throat> so I think ultimately it gets overturned and may not be this cycle, it may be for 2024. But, it's a, but it, it is a real challenge when the power structure decides to change the rules as black and brown people are gaining, uh, gaining more power. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what do you guys think about the current administration? 
Well, first of all, the cloud that uh, uh, the cloud that came over this administration when when it's when he took power is still there. Mm -hmm. If anything, it has gotten even darker. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by darker, the the investigations. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there he's under four or five various investigations from the state of New York to uh, uh, campaign finance rules to. Uh, they're now looking into uh, the inaugural committee and how they spent their funds. Uh, and of course, we're still waiting to find out uh, what's going to happen with the Mueller investigation, special counsel, Robert Mueller investigation. I, I believe we have one president at a time. Clearly, uh, Donald Trump is, in my judgment, one of the most disruptive presidents we've seen in a, in a long, long time. He's disrupted political norms. Uh, societal norms. Uh, he came in as an as an outsider to shake up the political establishment on the right, and I think he's managed to weaken and and uh, uh, weaken our democracy. And he's brought so much uncertainty to our financial markets. So I I believe that the the president has not been a good leader. He's not been a unifier. He's been a divider. And this his policies, whether it's on the border of uh, tariffs in China. Um, or even his, his latest uh, uh, statement about uh, shutting down the government because he cannot get the funding for his border wall. He's been an irresponsible leader. Mm -hmm. And I hope that we, uh, we find someone on the Democratic side to compete uh, and win in 2020. And do you think that uh, Trump is a contender to be reelected for 2020? Well, he's definitely, he's the president, so if he makes it through this investigation and all the rest of this, he's, he's probably going to run. Yeah. I, I, I think that uh, um, of the names that are being bandied about on the Democratic side, they're all very talented mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, leaders, all of them. Mm -hmm. And I think any one of them will make a great president. Okay. Now, how whether they survive a campaign is an entirely different mm -hmm. story. Yeah. Campaigning is different from government. Very different. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, it is, a, it is, and we've seen it from the staff side. It is a, uh, it is a marathon race, unlike any other, and you get to see what people are made of, the pressures that they have to endure over mm -hmm. pretty much two years of campaigning. You get to see people under the bright lights. Mm -hmm. You get to their whole lives become open in this day and age where you can find out anything about anybody. So we'll see who's able to. Uh, survive the pressure, mm -hmm. be graceful under pressure, mm -hmm. and present the country with some ideas. I think we're at a place where people want to be aspirational. They want to be for something. You mm -hmm. want to feel like you're working for something and not just being against someone yeah. or somebody. Uh, I think any, and so we'll see. I don't, I don't know. I, I'd be happy with almost any of them that are, that are out there right now because I think they're as legislators and as governors and as senators, they've proven that they, they've proven their metal mm -hmm. and proven that they have uh, democratic values mm -hmm. at stake. This president is a disaster, uh, an unmitigated disaster, and has taken our country to a place where we're okay. And every day, he demonstrates a lack of compassion that I think has been at the heart, or at least as part of the ideals of what the American government is. This little girl, seven years old, Awful. who died mm -hmm. of dehydration mm -hmm. in one of the in one of the camps. That is simple. They wouldn't give her water. Mm. Water is free. Yes, I checked. So just the basic that you mm -hmm. could have a seven-year-old and deny her water to the extent that she dehydrates and dies. It, Where's the outrage? Where's, 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 the out, where's the compassion of our government? What Trump has done is unleash the people who are racist, who are sexist, mm -hmm. unleash the worst in people and made it okay that you could be, you could see the little girl dying and not de and deny her water. I think we're becoming desensitized. And we're yeah, becoming I, I desensitized. So it happens we're so normalizing much. normalizing it because the crazy has reached such a level. We just normalize it. So we go, oh, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. That's, the scary, that's, that's the, the scary part. That is the scary part. You know, I look on Facebook against. every day, and I used to a year ago. I would get so upset. I'd wake up and I'd cry if I, if I saw a black man shot by a cop or something. Mm-hmm. And now you look at it, and it's just like all the time. Mm-hmm. And what we have to guard against, and this is to your early point, Desmond Tutu said that he was a prisoner of hope. In his hardest times in South Africa, he said, I'm a prisoner of hope. I think we've got to not allow this man and his administration, the things we know about and the things we don't have any idea he's doing, mm-hmm. to discourage us and move out. We got to keep the main thing the main thing and keep our eyes on the North Star, which is we got to change the leadership in this country mm-hmm. and to move it to a place that we know it is a government that is supporting our hopes and our ideals mm-hmm. and our aspirations for us to live the lives that we want to live. That has to be where we're focused and we've got to do everything we can and it's fighting against the noise mm-hmm. it's yeah. fighting against the drama it's fighting against all of that to keep moving forward and not let him be a distraction but done. let him be a motivator yeah. to yeah. keep us focused because he wants chaos yeah. he wants chaos. chaos he's divided yes. and he wants chaos he wants to be chaotic all the time and you can almost mark every time he sends out a crazy tweet there's something else happening yeah, trying, yeah, trying trying to, trying to, to, yeah. Yeah. When you said uh, the things we don't know about, I honestly thought about Stephen Miller today, and mm-hmm. I was like, "What is he doing? He's been mm-hmm. real quiet. Sure. Yeah. Been quiet. I wonder what he's up yeah. to right now. Because we know he's friends with Steve. Oh yeah. Okay. So what is he up to right now? But you are so right. Um. So I am. Hi, Mignon. Welcome to the table. Thank you. I apologize. I'm not going to even stop you. I'll keep going. That's okay. Yeah. So we have the fourth Arthur, and we're just now wrapping up because we do. want uh, Miss Donna Brazil to get her meal. <laughs> Your meal? She's hungry. Um, but we just want to thank you so much for sharing. I feel so honored to be sitting at this table. Uh, Miss Brenda talked so much about oh, no, you, and um, I used to do the radio, and uh, she actually called for me, and you had set up an interview with Hillary Clinton yep. for my radio show back in 2008. I want to thank Danny Bakewell. I know he's not here, but I want to thank him for his, his leadership and empowering this community and mm-hmm. really providing a, a template uh, through his, his leadership and his work with the Brotherhood Crusade as well as the Centennial. Just He is a, a tremendous force. Uh, and just a very powerful and proven leader. So I just wanted to thank Danny Bakewell. And a very good friend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very good, very good friend. friend. Yeah. yeah. We just had a, uh, yesterday we did a um, sign up for Obamacare. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes, because we. Not tomorrow. Thank you. Yes, uh, but uh, for California, it's been extended uh-huh. uh, for another week, and then we also get another month. So right. after that, uh, we're going to do another one here, okay. January 8th, where Cover California will come and sign up individuals on the 8th of January. So the drop dead date for us in California is January 15th. Oh, okay. right. But, cool. you know, speaking to Mr. Bakewell and Pamela, when we found out that uh, the Trump administration had cut 90% of the funding for the mm-hmm. outreach and marketing, mm-hmm. and that was like $90 million, it's like, that's why we don't see anything on the yeah, internet. Right, that's why we yeah. don't see anything on the, um, TV. Right. And they were like, let's get on this. Well, they've been working to sabotage Obamacare, not only through regulations, but all through the courts. Mm-hmm. And in the tax package that passed, the individual mandate, so they are weakening Obamacare at a time when we know it's uh, people need uh, access to quality, affordable health care. Yeah, and what happens is when individuals don't sign up, it increases the premiums. Yep. So the more people that sign up, it keeps it right. at a yeah. fair cost for Absolutely. everybody. Mm-hmm. So make sure you sign up for Obamacare. Sure. <laughs> and yeah. we'll have another uh, sign up here at a food truck uh, Tuesday on January 8th. I want to thank you guys so much. This is a perfect Christmas gift, yes. Yes. especially if you have teenage young girls and even and for boys. the woman and boys, for colored girls who have considered politics. Donna Brazil, Yolanda Car- Caraway, Leah Daughtry, Mignon Moore, the authors of this book, they are pillars of our community on a national and worldwide level. And we just thank you ladies for your service. And tell us one more time about the conference that's coming up in February. It is Power Rising. It's a gathering by for and black women, by for and about black women. Go to our website www.powerrising.org. Uh, come and get your whole life. February twenty one mm-hmm. to the twenty first to the twenty fourth in New Orleans, Louisiana. Who that? 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so they're telling me, Mignon, I gotta ask you one question. Sure. Uh, tell us um, your thoughts of uh, why it's so important or why you think that um, someone would receive wisdom from this book. Um, I think basically if they just looked at us as four black girls from uh, different areas and different walks of life, they would probably see themselves in some of our narratives. Mm -hmm. And they would say, you know, well, these girls have accomplished something, but they came from basic and very humble means. Mm -hmm. So maybe I can too. So maybe it'll be an inspiration to women. Maybe it'll be an inspiration for friendships. So um, I think for us, it has always just been, can we part some wisdom? Can we share some of our life stories so that we can pay it forward for the next generation? All right. And so you worked with the Clinton administration. Yes, Word on the street is Hillary Clinton is thinking about putting her hat in for 2020. Do you have a little tea mm -hmm. for us? No tea for the fever. <laughs> <laughs> if she did decide to run again, would you be on the team to help? Well, I will always support Hillary, and I certainly will always be uh, there for her. I, I'm not sure if I'll be working in a presidential again, but if she needed anything for, from me, I would be more than happy to serve. Okay, guys, we got a little bit of tea right there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's for all of them, by the way. All right, so you can pick up the book for colored girls who have considered politics. Amazon, Barnes and Noble is right here in L.A. You can stop by Esso Juan Books. It's a perfect Christmas book. I am the L, Los Angeles Sentinel staff reporter, the Los Angeles Sentinel, your number one black source for news, views, and advocacy. You can visit www.lasentinel.net for all of the news or follow us on our social medias by key searching Los Angeles Sentinel newspaper. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy, holidays. Happy New Year.